So ladies and gentlemen, welcome again. And I'm going to call on stage three very interesting people. So we have, uh, who should I start with? Josh. Okay, Josh, come in. Maybe you sit in the middle or, uh, you know. Okay, Josh is the CEO of Onduo. We'll see what Onduo is just after. Then maybe Thomas? Thomas, welcome. Welcome. They clap for you, not me. Thomas uh, comes from a company called Alphabet. For those who do not know it, it's Google. That's right. Right? Okay. Yeah. But we also call you Verily. So we'll see what it is. And then, last but not least, Gilles. Gilles Littmann, come on stage. So guys, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves shortly, in order of appearance, maybe? Sure. Uh, Josh Riff from Onduo. I'm the CEO. Uh, glad to be here. Really happy to be in Paris. And we came in from Boston. Uh, I'm Tom Stennis. I've worked at the internet of Google's for a long time ago. And now I work at Verily, focus on using data to improve health healthcare across many, many different efforts, my favorite being Onduo. And so I'm, I'm Gilles Littmann. I'm the head of global integrated care for Sanofi for diabetes cardiovascular. And basically, we work around everything that we can add to the drug or around the drugs, like devices, like digital solutions, uh, data analytics, to improve diabetes management. All right. Cardiovascular. So now we know who you are. What made these two companies, Alphabet and Sanofi, decide to collaborate together. So wh where does it come from? Why did you do it? Right, so Google really was working on a lot of devices to try and understand the body, uh, including understanding glucose and trying to measure it every moment of every day. And we were learning about how to do this and we thought, well, we really want to use this data in helping people manage their, their disease and figure out how to deal with it. And we didn't know anything about diabetes, so I thought, well, who should we talk to that are true experts in this disease area that know really how to treat it and how to live with it. And Sanofi was the obvious question. So we, we came to Sanofi and talked to them about, hey, let's start a project together to really tackle this disease and, and bring the data together with the disease understanding and to build a different way of, of, of attacking it. Right, so on our side, it's the opposite. We know about diabetes. We know nothing or very little about technology. So for us, it was obvious and even, I would say, an honor to have a chance to work with a company like, uh, like Google. Uh, I would also add that we've been in diabetes for decades. We have drugs, innovation coming all over. We continue to be focused on it, but the diabetes management is not optimal at all today. You have 4 mil 400 million people suffering from it, huge uh, burden on cost, $700 billion in, in the world, and half of the people not well controlled. So we need to do more, and more means bringing technology, digital data, on top of drugs to combine and, and improve the outcomes. Is this what we call drug plus or is it something else? I think there are as many names as people talking about it. For me, what matters most is what we do in the end. And, and uh, so you can call it drug plus, we can call it integrated care, connected health. But what matters is really the difference you make in people's life. And that's, of course, the hardest part. So you find the right partner. And what did you create? Well, they, they created on Duo, um, so us. Uh, the, the idea was um, not quite drug plus, but if we want to build something for the consumer, how can we help them with the di their diabetes? And there's not a lot of consumers running around with diabetes saying, I want better drugs or I want more drugs. They're saying, I just want to live my life um, and I don't necessarily want to be on drugs. Um, and there's a, a, there's a huge um, problem with access. So getting people on the right care, and when we say care, it doesn't mean medications. It could be lifestyle, it could be support, it could be advice, or it could be medications. And so what they ended up building is really an ecosystem of what we call the virtual diabetes clinic with really one goal. And the one goal is how can we make sure that anybody living with diabetes could get access to the best, most up-to-date care. And that's really critical is that, that up-to-date part in that there's different people that depending on where you live, you could get better access to care. Um, and, and we just found that it was unfair. And the idea was how could we, through the convenience of your phone, 
anywhere, anytime, get you that same expert care as if you live in the center of Paris and you can get to the best healthcare systems in the world. And probably a little bit cheaper than in the center of Paris. All right. Hopefully. So you, we have a, a movie we could show, yeah. show a little bit what, how it came up. So can we launch the movie? Yep. Gilles. So uh, a couple of things in that that you may have noticed through the theme. So one of it is very phone-based, so that gets to the any, anywhere, anytime. We'll send you the equipment you need. So one of the things we've been really heavily leveraging are these continuous glucose monitors that you have to put on your body. Um, traditionally only prescribed by a physician in an office, placed in an office. Our physicians prescribe them remotely, send it to your doorstep in a box, um, and 100% of patients who receive them have been able to put them on, uh, on themselves. And the most important part, though, and I, I think this is um, really where Verily has played a monumental role, is you saw the cartoon of the tracing, but that's what you get to see on your phone. And what it does is it gives you instantaneous empowerment. Um, and it gives you an idea of control of how your medications control your life. Or if my glucose is high and I go for a 15-minute walk, how I could manage that disease. And you took a disease that normally required 90 days of blind faith to go get your blood tested at your doctor's office to know how you're doing to minute-by-minute minute control. Um, and it's that idea of consumer empowerment um, that we've really, really focused on. And I think that's where we're seeing some of our greatest success. Absolutely, and we see that customer empowerment or, or, or power in our hands is what all of us, we are seeking in our life, so in our health even more because it's probably the most private thing we have. Um, so, in super interesting uh, combination. Did it go smoothly all the way? How, how, how was uh, the ride? Because you, so you, you, it, it was you, perfect. Every day is sunshine and unicorns. <laughs> uh, Tom, why don't you start? Yeah, so I, you can imagine two giant companies coming together with very different cultures, very different backgrounds. There's going to be different worldviews, different cultures, everything like that. And I like to tell a story about a very specific thing because for us at, at Verily, seeing, I have to get closed close in my mouth. Uh, Thinking more than six months in the future, that, that's, that's forever. That, that's a million years from now. For Sanofi, thinking less than six years in the future, that, that's yesterday. Uh, so thinking about how do two companies that look at things from either six months or six years, how do they talk about what to do next, uh, that's a hard thing to do. So last November, Jill and I were sitting down looking at, hey, there's 200 items that we have to complete in order to launch in January. And Jill looked at me like, Tom, how is this possibly going to happen? And I was calm. I'm like, it's, it's fine. That's just the way, way things go. And it was this moment where it was just, it felt like Gilles had to have faith that it was going to work out. And I had to spend the time to actually explain where we were going. And they really pushed me to, to, to look further in the future. And that was a really important moment. And it all worked out. We launched in January. And Gilles was like, oh my gosh, it worked. It was great. And, and I was like, yeah, 
I knew it was going to work, <laughs> but it was it, it was it took a lot of a, a lot of work on both sides in order to, to bridge that gap. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a very important point, and, and, and I agree. Uh, for us, it takes us around 10 years to develop a drug, and for very little, it's about months. So it has a lot of implication on the way you work, and it's true that we were a little bit nervous. And I, I told my team, I didn't tell you that after this meeting, I said. Either these guys are crazy or they are genius. And it proves that you are genius because you did it. But it's very impressive to see the approach to innovation is so different from the culture we have that we have to adapt our own mindset to make it. So speed is one. Also, I would say the uh, relationship to failure. You do not fear to fail. And you do not do tens of market research. The market research is the launch. They put a minimal viable product on the market in the hands of people and they see how it works, and they improve. Yep. Why we would tend to be much more in a control mode. So I think we are learning to work together more and more, and it's very interesting for both parties. But is the fact that you are working much in a much more regulated, and used to work in a much more regulated environment, does that mean that you can bring something to those crazy, uh, let's do an MVP and launch it immediately? Yeah, I think that that's one of the reasons why healthcare has not yet been transformed as other industries we can see here. But it's coming. I think the uh, potential of improvement is huge, and that's what Josh explained. And when you see how fast these guys develop something, it tells you how fast it will go when regulation will change, and it is changing as we speak. Yeah, I agree. It's one of those things where we've been actually sitting down with the FDA in the United States to think about how should we change the regulatory process to allow it to go faster. So we had part of this FDA pre-cert program to figure out how do you actually give technology companies a certification so that they can launch faster without having the FDA have to look over their shoulder every moment, but at the same time, really prove that it's going to be safe and effective so that consumers can really depend upon it. That's something that we've had to learn and really bring everybody along with us to see this is how it's done and this is how we can make sure it's safe. I, I think uh, I'll reiterate what Jill and Tom said, but I'll moderate it a bit. Unduo is smack dab in the middle, literally six hours time difference from Paris, six hours time difference from San Francisco. So mediating that those types of differences are pretty, like they're pretty profound. Um, but I think the biggest one, and I think in healthcare this is needed, is Google and Verily thinks in terms of moonshots. How could we do something so monumental um, with a massive chance of failure, but if it does work, it's going to be absolutely amazing versus Sanofi, which in my first couple of weeks, one of my Sanofi board members asked me for a 10-year financial forecast before we had a clue of what we're doing. Um, in healthcare, you need to be exactly somewhere in the middle. Because if you try to do moonshots in healthcare, you get into, you'll get you never get reimbursed because it's, it, it's just so hard to do. Um, it's like the cancer cures. We've been looking, waiting 30 years for that moonshot. If you were a startup trying to cure cancer 30 years ago, chances are you're not going to be around today. But if you want to transform and build for the consumer, you can't do it through an old model of a large company where you have to protect P&Ls. And so that merger or the marriage of these two different companies, tech and healthcare, has really allowed to create on Duo, which is a moderation of the two. So I'm... I'm I'm going to go a little bit off uh, the, 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 the past we took, but is there any moment when you realize that your culture is so different? So that, one, that was one, uh, but are there any, any other moments where you said, wow, we really have a different culture? Or how do you uh, scan for that? How do you make sure that you're not engaging into something and, and not really know what's happening? So how do you get a, a step back and say, how are we working together? Uh. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll take this just because I'm stuck in the middle. Um, <laughs> it, I, I don't, it, any culture, any partnership, you come from different points of view. I, I think the number one thing I focused in the first three to six months was on relationship building, making sure that the teams spend to get time together. We get a lot of face time. We do activities together to build trust. Um, and we, I think twice a year, we do surveys and check-ins and I'm always talking to the teams and seeing how things are going. And the number one thing that we could do is build trust between partnerships. So when Tom says, trust me, we're going to launch, or Jill says, trust me, I have to do this audit, um, we trust each other and we put the work in to do it. Well, yeah, I think one of the things I remember early on was I didn't know anything about diabetes, so I sat down with an endocrinologist to try and learn about how this all works. And it was, you really had to come with a very 
um, humble attitude towards the whole thing and, and realize, oh, it's way more complicated than you realize. So they would start off, they would give me problems of this patient comes in with these doses and this is their logbook and everything like that. What would you do in the middle? And I was like, I don't know. It was, you really are, are rethinking of how you approach a problem and then you would realize, oh, this, this patient is different because they have this other disease that's, that's complicating it. And I'm like, oh, I, how did, that's like out of left field. How am I supposed to know that? But you really, healthcare is quite complicated uh, and we needed to understand that deeply. Yeah, so I'd like to moderate Josh a little bit as well because Sanofi does not only care about financials and audit. <laughs> I think the reason why it works is because we commonly believe in what we are doing. We, we see the huge challenge of diabetes management and we, we know it because we've been in that for decades and we know what we still have to do. So I think we share a common purpose. And, and when you share a purpose, that's a, a good step. Now you're also asking, when did we realize the culture was different? It was very immediate because uh, of the dress code. You know, I'm the only one having a tie on that one. Now I left it and I hope to get closer to my neighbors. Uh, ours was when they served us wine at lunch. It was... Ah. <laughs> okay, so you launched, correct? Absolutely. How did it go? It was, it was amazing, it was frightening, it was scary, um, but at the end it was exhilarating and really, really gratifying. So um, this is uh, another one of those cultural things where my own company, I have a mix of startup people as well as um, uh, long-standing Fortune 100 companies. And any time you launch, um, it is a terrifying moment because you don't know what's going to go right, what's going to go wrong. On launch day, lots of things went wrong, but one thing went really right is we had lots and lots of people who registered and downloaded the app um, and hundreds of people who got involved in the program. And the greatest thing was literally within a week, we started getting comments on our Facebook page, we started getting comments about our coaches and people telling us things uh, like, I've lived with this disease for 10 years, I've never understood this about me or I never understood what this drug did to me and now I understand and now I'm starting to take it. Um, and so just to get that, that consumer feedback, I think that's what we all live for um, and it's why we built it. So it was absolutely amazing and, and I couldn't thank our partners more. Tom Gilles on the launch. Yeah, I, I really pushed on us to launch early because I knew that uh, we had a lot of ideas about where we were going next, but nothing really brings clarity by seeing your customers and seeing what they're saying. And you often forget this. I, I like to say that sometimes the biggest opportunities are only present in the rearview mirror. You don't actually notice them until they're past. For example, after we launched, we were wondering about what was our what was the key feature that everyone was going to hook onto? What was the thing that everyone was going to like the most? And we would get comments from one woman who said, the most amazing thing you guys did for me was that you were able to deliver my blood glucose strips to my door because I couldn't get them otherwise. And that was not on the, anywhere on the list of the features that we were really caring about. But that was what the customers had. They had this real basic access problem that we were solving for them. And that was a really defining moment for us. Yeah. And I would just add that. So first of all, I'm very proud of the work that has been done. And I will, I will turn now to, to Josh and Tom because they did a lot of it. But it's a reality. Now it exists. We are beyond our objectives in terms of enrollment. And, and my goal now moving forward is to help Josh and, and Tom to leverage Sanofi capabilities as much as we can to expand, first of all, in the US and beyond international. Because I think that the, the particularity of Fondue is to have two shareholders like Verily and, and Sanofi. If you compare to many startups in that field, there are, but they don't have our capability. Yep. So if we are smart enough to find a way to combine our know-how, and it's not so easy, I think we can make a big difference with what Onduo will become. So what advice are you giving for scaling up? Because scaling up is a huge issue for startups, and you've been scaled up for a long time now. So what kind of advice can you, can you give? And, and Josh, what are you seeking? So. Um, my advice first would be just do something. So there's so many startups who will talk about things or large companies who will have ideas. Um, Tom said it right, just every day was, we got a launch, we got a launch, we got a launch, just do something, even if it's small, manual. Um, the biggest advice I have about scale is um, put scale out of your mind in terms of ease. 
um, and figure out how to serve the consumers you have now. Um, so there's a fantastic story about Airbnb, about how they kept trying to say, how do we scale, how do we scale, and they finally determined that they couldn't unless they understood their consumers today. And so everybody will come up with a solution, or all the time we come up with solutions and we say that's not scalable, and I'm always arguing, well, try it, see what we learn from it, and if it really works, then we'll figure out how to scale after. Don't try to have answers for how could I replicate this globally now, and if I can't replicate it globally now, I'm not going to do it, because you'll lose some phenomenal opportunities. Another thing I would like to say about that is that Generally, scaling is a combination of a thousand little things that you do that all together add up to 10x, right? It's not that there's just one thing you're going to do that's all of a sudden going to make everything scale. You need to be thinking about what are the small things I'm going to do that are multiplied, the 1.3x's, the 1.2x's, that you multiply them all together and eventually you get to 10x. So I, I, I want to just piggyback on that. So um, one of the things we're finding is that we talk a lot about clinical and lifestyle, but there's a, a kind of social determinants of health, right? Access to transportation, could you find a way to get to your doctor? Could you find clean water? Could you find healthy food? Um, we talk a lot, a lot about that in Onduo, and every solution, that every idea that we were coming up with, the team was saying, not scalable, not scalable. It's not scalable to find grocery coupons for the grocery store that's down the street from the patient or the consumer. And our answer went back to that idea of, let's just try things. And so one of the things that we're really pushing our cultures is culture of experimentation. Um, just try little things, and if it works, then you'll figure out how to replicate it. Um, but don't think, how do I scale this? And if I can't scale this, I'm not going to try it. Because to Tom's point, all those thousand things, none of them will get started. Um, because they're, they're, I cannot think of any company that's ever developed a scalable solution in a lab, and then they've scaled it to the world. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Jill, on scaling? Yeah, I mean, on scaling, I think the, the where it starts to be really interesting is with Verily, we have, I think, a company that has built something so solid compared to smaller startup, and we discussed that, that we can hope and expect that it's going to be able to scale up, technically. On our side, where we are bringing scale is simply because we are working and meeting with healthcare professionals every day. We have an access to uh, general practitioners, specialists, hospital, pharmacists, uh, that no small company has. So when the product is ready, we have to find a way to bring that product to them, but we have already the people and the customers know how, which has been built in decades. Okay, I'd like to wrap up this session with uh, how did you, what did you learn from this so far? What's the lessons learned into starting uh, something? So something that my boss who is here is saying of, often is, they're trying and be optimistic because I can tell you, you need a lot of faith in what you do, in why you're doing it to go because you have lots of obstacles. And something I, I really like about my neighbors, it's also a cultural difference, uh, is that you hear a lot of the world, amazing, phenomenal, and, and it feels good. You know, it feels good to see the positive part of things. So believing in what we do, having a lot of willpower, the courage, even though you, you fail, we were talking with Tom about the appetite for failure. I think you learn so much more from a failure that if you see it this way, you learn. So this is something I've really learned, and I'm trying to import it a little bit more in my company. I think one of the things that really blew me away was the first time you see that one person that you really touched their health with. That I didn't realize how impactful that was going to be for me to say I really made a difference in not just um, you know, how much someone clicked on an ad or something like that. It was like, no, someone's health changed because of the work I did. And that was so empowering and not something I really expected to be that powerful for me. Cool. Uh, I'd say it's twofold. One is just the investment in relationships. Um, that's what businesses are built on and, and investing in your team, investing in your partners, investing in your consumers and understanding those relationships. And then the second is just a relentless passion and pursuit. Um, I couldn't, I don't think any of us could do this um, if this was just about a JV or just about financials. Or just, this is about one relentless pursuit, which is how do we make that consumer's life easier living with diabetes? And if you could have that, un, like, you're like a dog on a bone. You will not let go of it until you could accomplish that goal. It's the only way a startup could survive. Let me grab one of your mics. We have very little time, but is there a question in the room? Somebody wants to ask something? Hello, uh, 
so the kit that you provide replaces something that's not being done. People aren't following their care properly. What percent of people do not properly take care of themselves before they come to you? So, so I think the question was, we send a kit with some equipment, what percent of people don't take care of themselves before? Yeah, so it, it's, a, it's a great question. At least in the United States, 50% of people with diabetes are not at what's considered uh, diabetes control, meaning that their A1C, their blood pressure, their glucose, and they don't smoke. Um, so that's 50%, and it's for various different reasons. Um, one of the things that we see really quickly when we give them the, uh, these glucose tools or some of these tools is we don't give it to them the way a traditional monitor is used to say, so you could know your number. It's, it's so we could know your numbers, and then we could build trends and analysis and give you insights off of that. So some people are high every Monday, and they don't know why. They've never picked up that trend. We could start picking up that trend and start looking at things they're doing Sunday uh, the coaches could work with them to identify why is it on Monday. Um, and so the tools we use are really important. We don't say this is the tool. We say this is a thing that will allow you to do X or Y or communicate, etc. Good question. Thank you very much. One, one question. Sorry, I can only take one. So um, I have a question about your vision for the future. Because what you provide now just concerns diabetes. But diabetes is also uh, connected with heart disease. Yeah. Statistically, uh, people who have diabetes really progress and have heart conditions. So are you going to tell people more holistic approach to their management? A absolutely. And, uh, yeah. So I, I put the hierarchy like this. The first thing we have to do is prove that we could build a digital trusting relationship with them. Once we have that, and that's our app allows us to build a relationship, we could then change the behavior, and that behavior for us starts with glucose control. After that, we believe we have to be able to affect cardiovascular, blood pressure, cholesterol, weight, as well as mental health. Um, for us, that's the whole person. So if you have somebody who's too depressed to manage their diabetes, managing their diabetes is useless. Um, but to do that, we really have to prove we could build trust and change behavior. And glucose is the easiest, fastest thing to show that you could change. But absolutely. I'll add to that. Um, the one barely really wants to bring all this to all kinds of diseases. The reason we started in diabetes is because glucose is a very well understood biological thing that you can track over time and has people understand how it relates to long term outcomes. Uh, we want to build the same thing in other diseases. So, is there something we can measure continuously about people to understand cardiovascular or neurodegenerative or what other diseases are? Yes, we're working on that as well, but really we're trying to focus on how can we get all the way to the end of pa to patient care in one area where it's best understood today. Does that make sense? All right, guys, I want to give you, I think we should give them a big round of applause. I want to give you a big thank you. Stay with us. We are starting a pitching session dedicated to living with lifelong condition and diabetes and cardiovascular. So we are right smack in the middle, and this is where it happens. We're at the Tech for Health lab at Sanofi at VivaTech. It's going to. We're taking two minutes. Stay, and then we'll have five startup pitching their products. jury the jury of this next uh, pitching session to come forward please if you want to have a seat hello 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 please have a seat